our scripture reading and opening prayer. From Matthew 5, starting with verse number 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Dear Lord God in heaven, thank you for this Lord's day and all who came to your house. We pray, dear God, that everyone will receive a blessing from being here in your presence. And we're just thankful for what he did for us. And I pray we'll grant him the honor that he's worthy of. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're sorry that Bruce and Pat cannot be here today. Bruce is real sick. Pat has been sick. So I'll be taking care of the songs and uh, we'll be singing a cappella unless Howard wants to come and play the piano, do you? Okay. James, you want to? You want to play? No, James? Well, okay. We may let it rest then. We're going to sing 229 Victory in Jesus. <clears throat> we'll be using all three stanzas. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed this blessed command and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. 
about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He As we prepare for the communion service, we want to check to see if there's anybody here who did not receive their communion packet. If you did not and would like to partake of communion with us this morning, raise your hand and we'll bring the packet to your seat. Speaking of the communion, uh, we're starting to get back to the old traditional way of taking communion and also uh, of taking up the offering, which is passing the basket. We will soon, hopefully, start passing the communion as we used to in the trays, but we're still, of course, going to use the packets for a while. But we are going to start passing the uh, offering trays, baskets, uh, immediately after the communion service. And then uh, we will have our special music. So uh, that will be different. But the communion service will be the same as we have been doing, to be cautious until people feel more comfortable uh, because of people still getting COVID. So at this time, we will be singing uh, two verses of Breaking of Bread, and uh, that'll be verse 1, and verse 2. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we break the bread in memory of that great sacrifice on Calvary. Now who break the bread? Bless thou the cup, dear Lord, to us this day. May we with hearts prepared his word
Matthew 3, 13 through 17. The gospel describes two dramatic occasions when the Father spoke from heaven regarding Jesus with the words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The first was following Jesus' baptism. The second was during his transfiguration. Uh, it was the first. <clears throat> it is not recorded that the Father spoke these words while Jesus was being crucified. In one way, the words might have seemed inappropriate. Jesus, while on the cross, became the embodiment of sin, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Reads as, <clears throat> God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He also became the focus of the curse that sin brought with it according to Galatians 3.13. reads as, Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, is everyone who is cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Excuse me. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the Father was pleased with his Son at Calvary because Jesus was rendering perfect obedience and submitting to the cross. The Heavenly Father is pleased by obedience. Earthly fathers understand that. Because they also take pleasure in their children's obedience, to obey is to exhibit trust, respect, submission, and commitment. When children fall, fail to obey, they must receive punishment. Neither the Heavenly Father nor earthly fathers delight in administering punishment. We will not hear a voice from heaven today praise us for our obedience in meeting around this table. But we can be sure that our Father is pleased that we have made this communion service a priority. His son has commanded us, do this in remembrance of me, and we are obeying that command. The father and son will be further pleased if we use this time of partaking to pledge ourselves to childlike obedience in all phases of our lives. Let us do so as we engage in our own personal meditation. Junior church now or after the song? Okay, after the song this morning, uh, junior church can be dismissed.
Thank you, Marvin, uh, for the devotional this morning, leading our hearts in the communion service. In the book of Mark, chapter 4, is four parables. And each of those parables will make reference to the growing of a church. A great scholar by the name of Nofel Staten among the Christian churches and churches of Christ was the former president of Pacific Christian College. He wrote a Bible study on Mark, and on chapter 4 of Mark, Brother Staten made these five observations about growing a church. And let's see if we can make the connection with these parables as we read them. Uh, number one, kingdom growth, in other words, growing a church, comes from God. It's not man-made. Number two, growth is intentional. It doesn't just happen. People have to want it to happen. Number three, growth sometimes goes unnoticed. Sometimes we get impatient and think not enough is happening soon enough without recognizing what is happening in a church. And then we see that growth requires methods. Last of all, he pointed out from these verses that growth requires trust and patience. We're going to begin with the text that I'm going to use for the sermon, which is chapter 4, verses 30 
to 34. This is the parable of the mustard seed. It shows us how the church often starts out very small, as it did in the Bible. And then it grows, sometimes very rapidly. Verse 30 says, again he said, and these are the words of Jesus, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? And of course the kingdom of God is in reference to the church. What is the church like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed. Mustard seeds are very small, and they were well known in Israel among the people, but it was the smallest seed that they actually worked with. It's not the smallest seed in the world, but it's the smallest one that they used to plant. My two sisters, Bonnie and Susan, used to have a necklace. The outside of it was glass, and on the inside, some of you had these uh, years ago, a small seed that was a mustard seed, and it was magnified so you could see it. So Jesus said it's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Parables are good because they're stories about eternal truths. Sometimes just speaking directly about theology, or some particular doctrine of the church, it's hard for people to understand. But when you can break it all down into a story, it makes it much easier to understand. And that's what Jesus did. He told stories about heaven. He told stories about life, about what's right and about what's wrong. And he referred to them as parables. And the common people and everybody else could understand them very easily. You didn't have to be a theologian like the Pharisees were, who did know the Bible real well, but sometimes they weren't able to relate it real well to the people. But the people really loved to hear Jesus tell his parables. And they would, for hours and hours, listen to him if he was out on the side they were out on the side of the river and he was preaching from his boat or if they were up on a mountainside and he was preaching to them so his voice could be heard uh, through the valley sometimes they listened so long that they got tired and weak and that's when Jesus on two occasions told his disciples to feed them give them something to eat before he sent them home and on one occasion, they fed 5,000 men, which probably was at least 15 or 20,000 people, counting women and children. And on another occasion, he fed 4,000 men. So, you know, we can't imagine somebody such a great speaker that we would, for hours, sit and listen to them, even to the point that we're hungry. But they did with Jesus, because his parables were so practical and so everyday. Now he's going to talk about a parable that we see at the beginning of the chapter about a growing church. And we'll read about it in verses 1 through 20. If you notice on the screen these words, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. I told you he preached at various places, sometimes in a synagogue, which is sort of like a church. Uh, sometimes out on the lake, sometimes in the mountains. Aaron Davis, who's going to be having a revival with us in three or four weeks, November 11 through 13, uh, has a church in Johnson County, which is growing very rapidly. One of the things that they do in the summer is have a program that they call WOW, W-O-W. 
W. And it's called Worship Outside the Walls. And they go to various places out in nature. Maybe it might be somebody's home if they have a large property, a state park, uh, maybe some trails. And they all meet and go to these places. And then while they're there, Aaron will preach to them out in the open. So the people went outside the walls of the church to hear Jesus. And that's where he's at right now. He's at the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, now he's going to begin a parable about a farmer. Now the reason he uses a lot of stories about farmers is because it was a farming community. The Israelites were basically farmers. And, you know, when a preacher goes to a farming community, it's good to use stories about farming. If he goes to a mining community, it'd be good for him to use stories about mining. If he goes into the city, it'd be good to use stories about city life. But Jesus used these stories about farming and about seeds and about gardens. And even though we don't garden as much as we used to, most of us put out plants uh, for flowers to decorate with, and we put out tomato plants and various things. And some people have large gardens, some people have very small gardens, but we're all familiar with sowing seed. So that means putting the seed in the ground. Listen, he said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, now we're going to see something here that we need to pay attention to. He was scattering the seed, just like maybe you could take your hand and throw it. Let's say you're planting seed, maybe grass seed, in a place in your yard that is now bare and you're trying to get more to come back. And you take your handful and, and you throw it out, and some of it's going to land in different places, but just by throwing it. Some of it might land on your your driveway or on your sidewalk or out where the weeds are. And that's what he's going to talk about. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. And I've had that happen with seed that I planted before. That birds would almost come and eat it before I had a chance to put some straw on it so it could grow. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. That means it fell out like on the creek bank where there were rocks and weeds. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. You know, if you put grass seed out there on the creek bank when the weeds are real high, the weeds are just going to take over. There's not going to be any grass seed as a result of that. So that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. Most of the time we kind of prep the soil a little bit. You know, we dig it up and, and, and make it loose. And sometimes we put some fertilizer on it. And then we put the seed on it. And so that's what's being talked about here, that uh, the ground was prepared with the good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop. And some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And usually that's what happens, especially when we uh, plant grass seed or if we uh, put out plants or seed for plants to have vegetables with. They just keep growing and growing and growing until there's maybe a whole bunch of it. 60, some 60, some 30, some 100. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So now we see that Jesus told this story to all these people. And interestingly enough, the, the, the ones that understood it the least was the 12 apostles. So it says in verse 10, when he was alone, the 12 and others around him, there were some other people that followed Jesus that were called disciples, 
around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Jesus is going to tell them directly, I'm going to die, I'm going to have to be crucified, I'm going to be put in a tomb, but I'm going to raise again. Now Jesus did not tell that story to the people that were listening, who are not part of the disciples, especially the inner twelve. He said, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Well, Jesus is pointing out here something that we know is, is true. Somebody can be speaking to us. A teacher can be teaching us. A preacher can be preaching to us. And we're just not paying attention. We may be too hot too tired, too hot, we may be too cold, we may be having pain, we may be worried about uh, something that's going on around us or in our life, and we're just not, as Jesus said, perceiving. We're not listening close enough. And it just goes in one ear and out the other. It just goes over our head, so to speak. So Jesus is saying that this will happen to many people, that they'll hear it, but they're not really paying attention to it. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? He asked the question. He assumed that, that they would. How then will you understand any parable? He must have thought this was a very simple one to understand. He said the farmer sows the word. So he's saying instead of the farmer sowing seed, he's sowing Bible words to people. He's putting the word of God out. Some people are like the seed, so uh, along the path where the word is sown. He's going to talk to us about four kinds of people. As soon as they hear it, some of the people, as soon as they hear the word of God, Jesus said, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Many people think the word of God is nonsense. And it's because Satan has taken it out of their hearts. Or they just don't pay any attention to it. No matter who's telling them about the word, if somebody's just telling them about it personally, or if a preacher's doing it from a pulpit, or uh, a family member is explaining something, it just doesn't soak in. Because Satan has stolen it from their heart. Then he says, others, like seeds sown in rocky places, hear the word and once receive it. Sometimes people hear God's word and they, oh, I want it. I want to be a Christian. I want to be baptized. Uh, I want to confess Christ. I want to do all I can for the Lord. And it says they do it with joy. They're so happy the day you baptize them. They're just so excited. And, and they may even shout in the baptistry and say praise God and, and all kind of things. And... But maybe in a few weeks or a few months or a couple of years, well, something bad happens. They hear it, but verse 17 says, since they have no root, they last only a short time. When, and, he, and he says this is what causes them to give up. Trouble or persecution comes because of the word they quickly fall away. Christians can fall away. And one of the things that causes them to fall away is trouble in their lives or persecution or somebody making fun of them because they're Christians and, and maybe they're doing some suffering going through uh, standing up for Christ and trying to confess his name. Then he talks about another group of people. He said they're like seed sown among thorns. They're like the seed that went over the creek bank where all those weeds were. And he said, they hear the word of God, and they even accept it, but this is what happens to them. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Some people are just so worried about making money in life, providing for themselves maybe even luxuries that they completely ignore their faith. And he says, worries can cause this. 
And we live in a time of great worry on the international scene, in our country where it's difficult to go to the store and, and buy all the groceries that you used to because you can't afford it, and the electric bills are going up, and there's just so many worries. You send your children off to school and you're worried, is somebody going to come in the building and harm them? And all kind of worries in life. And he said, if we let them, these things will choke our faith. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But he says that is unfruitful. But then the last category is the one I hope that all of us are in. Others like seed sown on good soil Hear the word, accept it, not just only hear it, but accept it, and produce a crop. Accepting the word also means doing what the word said. From the time that you're told to have faith, from the time you're told to uh, repent, from the time you're told to confess, from the time you're told to be baptized, you, you hear it and you do it. And when you do obey the gospel, it says, and accept it, it produces a crop. In other words, you're going to get other people to be Christians. You're going to grow in the faith. And notice some 30, and look at how different groups, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. So one person becomes a Christian, and they obey, they do God's will, they serve all their lives. You know, a good friend of mine just died this morning. I appreciate all of you who uh, prayed for John Alston, a preacher who's preached here many times, uh, not in recent years, but he is a great preacher. And uh, I think about all the people that he influenced, and all the people that he baptized, and, and so it is with you and I, even though we may not baptize as many people as others or led others into baptism, your influence as a Christian, even though maybe it was 30 or 60 or 100, it's still very, very much for God. And we need to realize this is how we grow a church. It comes from God. We plant the seed which is the word of God, but God makes it grow. You know, preachers can't take credit for Christians because a lot of people planted the seed. I think about myself, and I have the privilege of when a person obeys the gospel and hears the invitation and comes down the aisle, I have the privilege of baptizing them. Now, sometimes with those people, I planted the seed. I'd go to their house, I'd open the Bible, I'd tell them about Jesus and what he did, and maybe have some other lessons for them, maybe even some film strips and uh, videos as it is today, and they obey. And they see the need to obey, and they do. But you know, for the most part, when people come in a church service and accept the gospel, it's because somebody in the congregation planted the seed. Some mother or father planted the seed in their children. Some wife planted the seed in her husband who was not a, yet a Christian. Some husband planted the seed in his wife who was not yet a Christian. Some child planted the seed in their parents' heart because the child came in the church first. Maybe a co-worker planted the seed. And all of these people planted the seed. But it was God who gave the increase. So we see from that parable, there's different kinds of hearts. And a lot of times, our responsibility is to prepare that heart for God. I told you that the seed that grows in good soil, good soil is defined as soil that is broken up, Maybe use a rototiller. You might even just use a shovel to break it up. Take a rake. Get the clots out of it, you know, so that the little seed uh, has a chance to grow. And then you take some fertilizer and, and put it on it. You might even want to cover it up uh, if the weather's cool or, or if the rain's going to be too hard. 
but you just keep protecting it and you keep watering it and you keep the weeds out of it. So that's what we have to do with people's hearts. Some people are just real hard-hearted. I've noticed that those kind of people can be brought to Christ and accept him. They can accept. And one of the things that sometimes softens their hearts is your and my love for them. That we cared enough to even maybe say something to them, not, not to uh, overwhelm them or, or, or criticize them, but just let them know that God is love and God forgives sins. And, and just gently leading them and, and being really nice to them and, and being a friend to them and, and doing good for them. And uh, anytime they have a need, if you need a good listener, you listen. Uh, if, if, if they need a little money, give them some money. If they need a ride to a doctor or a hospital, do it. And in doing so, we're preparing the ground for the gospel. It's something that we can all do. Jesus tells us to, that the cardinal thing is love, to love people. And love is what breaks down hard hearts. So let's remember that. I'm going to continue with this message on kingdom growth tonight uh, as we look at uh, two other parables and see what we can do in a practical way. We're going to start having four of our prayer meetings reinstated uh, this coming Tuesday and following all the way up to the revival uh, at 10 o'clock if anybody would like uh, to attend that prayer meeting. During that time, we will pray for those who are not yet Christians and uh, hope that God might touch their hearts through prayer. But it takes prayer and work from us to make a difference. So uh, God uh, prepares through prayer getting people together uh, by providence. Uh, Maybe we're going to want to talk to somebody about being a Christian. Let's, let's ask God for the right words and, and the right time to go to them. So, and, and when we pray, it will work. So that's going to be started this Tuesday morning. A lot of things are going to be started back up uh, again. Uh, and I'm not sure if we're going to keep the Tuesday morning service. I'm going to wait and see what others uh, prefer. Uh, some churches have a Wednesday morning service and a Wednesday evening service. Uh, we may go that route, but for four weeks before the revival, we're going to meet here, those who want to, at 10, or 11 o'clock, we changed the time. I'm sorry about that. Did it set up? 11 o'clock, and we'd like for you to, uh, to come out and uh, pray with us, and you'll be given names to pray for and to take home with you, and uh, hopefully we'll see some results of our meeting. But we may have somebody here today. Uh, who's not yet a Christian and who would like to step out for Christ. We already mentioned the plan of salvation, which is your faith and repentance and your confession of Christ. You're, you know, that's just saying before witnesses here that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then being immersed. And all that can be done this morning before you leave this place. Now, why don't we stand together now and, and sing our closing song of invitation. And if you have a need, I pray that you'll step out. And the title of this song is Only a Step. You know, it's not, it seems like a long way up here in this big building to come down this aisle. But if you just start, just take the first step, uh, then it's going to be a lot easier if you have a need. So let's sing the verse number one of Only a Step. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come on. 